uh, where, you know, it takes forever for emails to get to me. All right, where do we want to start? I presume 15 is as high up yeah, as I can see. Uh, you, you're fine with 14? Uh, I can yeah, do I, got, I can do I got, 14. I, I can I can see I'm enough 14. of 14 that I could do it. I got help from a friend on 14, so I already got it done. Okay. So yeah, we start with 15. The general equation of a parabola when, well, first of all, let's determine whether this is a vertical or a horizontal parabola. Okay? And the way we're going to do that is just graph its vertex and its focus. Okay? There's its vertex. Yeah. Its focus is right there. So what kind of parabola is this? Um, a sideways one? Mm, remember the focus is always on the same line of symmetry as the parabola. Which means the parabola uh, has to look uh, like that. It has to be vertical and it has to open up because the focus is always inside the parabola. It's never outside. Gotcha. What's P? That distance uh, right there. How much is it? It's, uh, wait. Just read, I the, don't know. read the graph. It goes from... Vertex is at 5 comma minus 1, and the focus is at 5 comma 1. So what's the distance from the vertex to the focus? Two. That's P. So P equals 2. Now, give me the standard equation of a vertical parabola, as opposed uh, to a horizontal parabola, which is a different standard equation. Vertical yeah. parabolas are the ones you've been dealing with for years. And they always are some variation of that. Horizontal parabolas are x equal y squared, not y equals x squared. Yeah. So we know we're looking at a y equal x squared type parabola. What's the general equation of that when you're talking about parabolas as conic sections? Uh, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r? That's a circle. Oh. Notice this is of the form y equal x squared. Okay. Now, tell me you're familiar with this, because not all school systems use this as the general format. Some of them continue yeah. to use A. Yeah, I'm familiar. Okay. P is the focal length. In other words, we know we just solved for P. It was 2. Yeah. What's the vertex? So we have uh, we have eight times y what? Remember remember h h and k are the vertex. So what's this so, so what's this y, expression? Y, one plus one. Good. What about the right side? Uh, x minus 5. Squared. There's your answer. Well, okay. hold on. Before I say that's the answer. That's the equation of the parabola. Okay. What's the axis of symmetry? 
Axis of symmetry is that thing there. What's the equation of that dotted line? What's the directrix? Remember what the directrix is. Directrix is always perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. And it's always the same distance away from the vertex that the focus is. The focus was two units above the vertex. That means the directrix is going to be two units below the vertex. What's the equation of the directrix? Uh, it would be y equals negative 5. Negative 3. Negative 3? It's two units down. Well, that coordinate's minus 1, the y coordinate. Okay. So I'm going p amount 2 below that vertex. That means that point, it's not really a point that we care about, it's the line. The equation of that line is y equal minus 3, that dotted line that is perpendicular to our line of symmetry. Yeah. And there's your three answers. We have the equation of the parabola. We have the vertical line of symmetry. Although it isn't always vertical, if we'd have had a horizontal parabola, we'd have had a horizontal line of symmetry. And then we have the equation of the directrix, which is always perpendicular to the equation of the line of symmetry. Any questions on this? I don't want to draw this parabola now. Just the way I've graphed it. You see the way I've drawn it on there? Yeah, do I go up, like up one, over one, um... There's no slope. This is not a straight line. So, no. What you do when you graph a parabola is you find the vertex, you find the focus, and then you draw the parabola about those two things. In other words, if, you, if I give you, I don't want to erase everything yet, but I, I'm afraid I have to. Um, if I tell you that the vertex is at 5 comma 3 and that the focus is at 5 comma minus 1, what does that tell me about the orientation of that parabola? It's going to be up. Uh, Hold on. Let's go draw the vertex, 5 comma 3, it's right there, and then find the focus. Where's the focus? 5 comma negative 1. Yeah, I actually did this wrong. I meant, I meant for it to be horizontal, and I gave you the wrong coordinates. Here, let me go back a step. I want this to be minus 1 comma 3, there. That's what I meant. Now, that's the vertex. If I find the focus, it's right here. Right? Yeah. What kind of parabola is this? Is it horizontal, vertical? Does it open up, down, left, or right? Uh, vertical, it opens up. Hold on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, it opens... It opens left. Yeah. In other words, it's a parabola that looks like that. Remember, the focus is always inside the parabola, and it's always parallel, or actually it is on the line of symmetry. The line of symmetry there is a horizontal line that is y equal 3. That's your line of symmetry for this particular parabola. 
And then if I want a directrix, it's going to be perpendicular to my line of symmetry, which means that's going to be a vertical line, x equals something. Yeah. Well, on my example problem, I didn't figure out a focus, so I don't know what x is equal to, but you get the idea. In other yeah. words, given the vertex and the focus, you can absolutely 100% establish whether it's Vertical opening up or down, or horizontal opening left or right. Gotcha. Just from those two things. How do we figure out the equation of that circle on number 16? Uh, we have to complete the square, right? Good. What do I do? to complete the square? Um, x squared minus 10x plus 34 equals 0. Hold on, what? Plus 34 equals 0. We're going to move the 34 to the other side. Always. That's really the first step. Doesn't look like it would be, but it is. Because when we complete the square, we're going to add numbers to the right side. So that right side is going to end up being positive. Okay. Which we need it to be. In other words, if we end up with x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals a negative number, we're screwed. We're dealing with a degenerative conic section. In, a, in other words, an impossible one. Uh, so what goes in the parentheses here? In my right parentheses? Uh, y squared minus 10y plus 25? Mm, not yet. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me. Here's the goal. Okay. The goal is to take that equation and make sure you do not change it line to line. Is my second row the same as that equation? Yeah. That's the goal. Now complete the square. What goes, let's go left to right, not right to left. What goes here? In other words, what goes on the right side of my x? Uh, would that be a plus 25? Now what do I have to do to balance it? Because I just changed the equation. Add 25 to the other side. Now do the y. Uh, another plus 25. Add another 25 to the right side. Now rewrite the left side in terms that resemble the equation of a circle. Um, what do you mean? Well, here's the format for the equation of a circle. x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. That's what we're trying to do with this equation, is get it into that format. So how can I write that? Uh, It's x minus something squared. What is it? Minus 5. Yeah. That's the whole, that's the only reason we complete the square. Every time you complete the square, you're able to write the term as a linear term squared. That's the whole yeah. point we complete the square. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to do it. Okay? Plus what? Yeah. I'm sorry? Plus what? Said. What's the y term? Oh, it would be y minus 5 squared. And then adding up these three numbers, what do you get? Uh, 16. Now we have it in this format. That's always the name of the game. 
is to put it into the, and it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, parabolas, the name of the game is to change the function and get it into the standard general format. Yeah. Which we now have. So how can I graph this circle? Where's the center of it? Let's start with the center. Uh, five, five. What's the radius? The radius is four. There's the graph of that circle. Not quite accurate. Doesn't go all the way down to the x-axis. Goes down to there. Goes four units there. Goes four units up and four units over. There's the graph of that circle. Now, Justin, have have you been taught ellipses yet? Um, a little bit. Hyperbolas? Yeah. So you're going to get questions on, on both of those conic sections? Yeah. Okay. The standard question, once you've been taught all four conic sections, there's only four, it's parabolas, circles, ellipses, and hyperbolas. The standard question is they give you a polynomial and they say, first of all, what kind of conic section is it? And second of all, put it into the equation that fits that conic section and then graph it. Yeah. So that's the ultimate question that you're going to get asked. In fact, you might get multiple questions. They might give you, the, of course, the fact that they tell you this is a circle leads me to believe that they're not going to give you that other higher degree of difficulty. Well, I hope not. Well, let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. What kind of figure is this? Uh, circle. It's not a circle. For it to be a circle, that coefficient has to be the same as that coefficient. Oh, really? Uh-huh. If they're not the same, it's an ellipse. Uh. And we would solve it the same way. We would still group the x terms together and complete the square and group the y terms together and complete the square, move the 34 on the other side, and then end up making the right side 1. Once you realize it's an ellipse, you know you have to have the right side equal to 1. But just by looking at the polynomial, that has to be an ellipse. Because yeah. the coefficients are not the same of the x squared and the y squared term. Uh -huh. Now, that's an ellipse. If I make one other change, hold on. Uh, sometimes I hate this problem, this program. If I make that a minus sign, that is a hyperbola. Oh. In fact, that is a horizontal hyperbola. I don't want to get too much into this because I, I don't know that you've had enough of this to make it worth our time to cover it. That's a vertical hyperbola. Yeah. Notice the difference. This case, the minus sign is in front of the y squared term. In this case, the minus sign is in front of the x squared term. Yeah. That's the difference between a horizontal and a vertical hyperbola. Yeah. But rather than me make up 
problems for you that I'm not sure you've had. Let's continue forward on these. We did 16. Yeah, let's just go problem to problem. I don't want to waste your time on stuff that you may not get. Yeah. Which, it, I haven't seen any questions on ellipses or hyperbolas. So yeah. I suspect I, uh, you probably don't have to deal with those. Yeah. Um, I've already got those ones done, so I think we can move to another picture, I think. Okay. One, two, six. Which is which? That we, would be bad. We were on the top left. What would be the next one? Where's 26? Trying to figure out where that would be. We're looking for 26? Yeah. Not that. That's, that's 41 or 42. Hold on. Uh, I, can, I can click on them real quick. There's no 26 on that one. I can just verbalize it to you. Hold on. I'm going to find 26 here. It doesn't take that long. I don't know. That's not... No, this is an answer key. Yeah. Nope. I don't have a 26. Go ahead and verbalize. Okay. It says, find the coordinates of the point halfway between negative 6, 5, and 9, 3. Find the coordinates, half, coordinates halfway between those. These are real easy. You want the point that's halfway between the x-coordinate, and you want the point that's halfway between the y-coordinate. Let's do the easy one first. What's halfway between the y-coordinates? Now, we got that 4 intuitively, knowing that 4 was halfway between 5 and 3, but the other way we got it was by adding 5 to 3 and dividing by 2. That's the way you do it, is you add the two together and divide by two. So what's the x halfway point? Uh, 7.5. Add the two x coordinates together and divide by two. What do you get? Oh, 1.5. Three halves. We'll call it three halves. I always right. prefer, I always prefer improper fractions to decimals 100% of the time. There's a reason. When you get to trig, everything's ratios, right? You don't get yeah. trig answers of 1.5. You get trig answers of 3 halves. Gotcha. So that's why. It's nothing uh, that a teacher might even agree with. It's just my preference. I prefer everything to be in ratios, not imp I, I would never give an answer like this. That's, an, that's a proper fraction. I hate proper fractions. You always have to take proper fractions and convert them to improper fractions to even do anything with them. So yeah. I don't like that answer. Okay. But finding a point that's midway between two points is as simple as adding the x-coordinates dividing by 2, adding the y-coordinates dividing by 2. That's what it is. Wait. Oh, all right. I think I sent you another one that I need to help with. Okay. Different picture. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't get it. You, you just sent it? Oh, no, I sent it earlier. Well, I got three earlier, but these are all from May 18th, which is four days ago. Oh, that's funny. Uh, I did get one today that has the six attachments. But I didn't get another one since this. Try to send another one right now. Okay. You 
can see who I have after you. <laughs> Dylan. Incidentally, I suggested to Dylan that someday this summer, the three of us ought to get together and play some ping pong. Yeah, or even the, the four of us. Get your dad involved and we'll play doubles. Double ping, doubles right. at ping pong is a lot of fun. Because every person has to hit every other shot. Okay, I got it now. In other words, you can't just play like normal. You have to get out of the way after you've hit a shot because then your opponent has the next shot. Yeah. Um, so we're here 35 to 39. All right. 35. I've been waiting for Kramer's rule ever since you told me about it. Uh, you love Kramer's rule, don't you? I don't, but at least I understand it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just got to look it up because it's a little difficult. But it's not so difficult for a 2x2. Two two. And that's what this okay. is going to be, is a 2x2. Two uh, Kramer's rule gets to be a lot more difficult when you have three equations and three unknowns, but this ah. is just two equations and two unknowns. So, uh, let's talk about determinants. Okay. In fact, let me go to my... That means determinant. How do you evaluate that? Um, A G minus B C. Uh huh. So when you're using Kramer's rule for two equations, here's the way it works. If you have AX plus BY equals S, and you have CX plus DY equals T, that resembles our problem, right? Yeah. Well, here's what X is equal to. The determinant... S, B, T, D over the determinant A, B, C, D. Huh. Now, notice there's a rhyme to this, or, or there's a reason to this. The bottom is the coefficients of the left side of this equation, right? Yeah. The top is the coefficients of everything but not the x term. Oh, man, this gets even harder. The order matters. In other words, this is not just the absence of a and c. It is, if I'm starting, if I'm eliminating the X, i got to start from the right. So that's how I get SB, is by starting from the right, SB. And then I start TD. So you see how I come up with this? Yeah. And as long as we're at it, let's write what the Y term is equal to. Well, the bottom is the same. A, B, C, D. The top, what do you suppose the top is? Eliminate the coefficients of the Y variable. So, two and three? Well, no, hold on. We're not talking about your problem yet. We're talking about a general formula. 
What's my uh, Y? My Y is A S C D. Oh yeah. Now notice how I got those. I crossed out my two coefficients of the Y and I was left with A S C T. I didn't mean to write that as a D, that's a T. Uh. And this is not that easy. And the fact that to get the X numerator, I had to go from right to left, right? Yeah. To get the Y numerator, I went from left to right. Okay. Each time, remember when I got the X numerator, I got... Didn't mean to do that. That's A and what the heck is that? Uh, C. To get the X numerator, I got rid of those two and went right to left. Yeah. Excuse me. Let me back up. That's not what I did. To get the x numerator, you get rid of the x coefficients, and you go right to left. So I had S, B, T, D. Uh, oh. To get the y coefficients, I cross out the y, excuse me, to get the y answer, I cross out the y coefficients and my numerator becomes the coefficients left over going left to right. Okay. The bottom is in both cases the coefficients of just the left side of the equation. So this is something that you would probably never discover on your own. And that's why they call it Kramer's Rule, if he discovered it, I guess. Actually, it's rather yeah. odd. Most math theorems never are named after the person that discovered them. So in, there's probably an 80% probability that this was not discovered by Kramer. Just like the Pythagoras theorem was not discovered by Pythagoras. Uh -huh. Or Newton's law was not discovered by Newton. It's amazing how many different theorems and rules have names that do not match the person that discovered them. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. Um, but anyway, back to this problem. First of all, do you understand how I got X and Y? Now, we still have to evaluate these determinants. These things that look like absolute value signs are merely a determinant. In other words, that is the determinant of that matrix. So what's the that equal to? Uh, seven. Oh, with these letters, not your numbers. We're still not on your problem yet. I want to make sure you can do it with letters because they're uh, just going to keep giving you the same problem with different numbers. So if we can do it with letters, you'll be able to do it with any combination of numbers. Okay. So what's the determinant uh, of the numerator for the x variable? x d minus b d. What's the denominator? Uh, AD minus BC. And the Y? What's the numerator? Uh, AD minus CS. And what's the denominator? AD minus BC. Okay. Now, we can go back and look at your problem and just plug in stuff. Okay. 
Now, I I don't want to leave that answer. I don't want to plug into this answer because this is not what you memorize. That is not what you memorize. What you memorize is the stuff above it. In other words, given that equation, excuse me, given those two equations, two variables, x and y, a, B, C, D, S, and T are all constants. So no matter what they are, we're going to be able to solve it. Okay? Now, what is your A and B in your equation? Uh, I don't want to go back to that page. What is it? A and B? Uh -huh. uh, two and two? What's S? Uh, seven. What's C, D, and T? Um, one, three, and four. So those are our two equations. Let me just double check. 2x plus 2y equals 7. x plus 3y equals 4. Okay. Now, solve for x using Kramer's rule. Just plug in the numbers. Um, Ds minus Bt. Hold on. No, this time I don't want you to do it with letters. I want you to plug in the numbers of our two equations. Uh, so let's ask. What's B. Q. What's T? Uh, one. Four. T is four. Uh huh. And D is three. Remember, this is A, B, B, C, D. That's S, that's T. What's the denominator? What is the determinant, the numbers, the matrix that is in that determinant sign in the denominator? Uh, two is A, and then two is B. Uh, 1 is C, and then 3 is D. Okay. Now, that's going to give us our answer for the X variable. That's pretty cool that we can do it this way. I mean, yeah. you've learned about 18 different ways to solve two simultaneous equations and two variables, but this is another one. This is a 19th way. What's that equal to? What's the uh, numerator? 21 minus eight. What's the denominator? Um, six minus two. Which is 13 over four. That's the X coordinate. Now let's do the Y coordinate. Now, notice the difficulty here. The difficulty, the bottom is always the same. The bottom is the coefficients on the left side of the equation. Okay? Always. Whether you're solving, notice that that bottom for X is the same as that bottom for Y. Okay. So we know what the bottom is. We just solved for it. We figured out the determinant of that denominator, and it was 4. So we know that's 4. Now, let's set up the determinant for the numerator based on that. What is uh, it? That would be 2 and then over 1. No, there's no over. Just 2. Well, I mean, yeah, 1 on the bottom. One. Wait, okay. And then 7 and 4. 2 and 7. Oh, you meant that one. Okay, my apologies. Yeah. My apologies. I didn't know that's what you meant. Okay, now, what does that give you? 
So that's your X solution and that's your Y solution. Yes. Now, the most difficult part of this problem in terms of trying to remember it is the fact that when I do the numerator for the X term, I go right to left. S is first, it's on the right. And then I go the next term that is not the coefficient of x. So it would have to be the coefficient of y. That's what b is. You with me? Yeah. In other words, that's 7. That's 2. But that 2 is the coefficient of the y term. That's 4. I'm going right to left. And that's 3, the other coefficient of the y term. Yeah. But when I solve for the y, I go left to right. In other words, I still drop the two coefficients for the y term, and that becomes 2 and then 7 and 1 and 4. Okay. So... How you're supposed to remember this, I'm not real sure. I wish I had a little trick. Uh, and it gets tougher if you're doing a 3x3 three three matrix. In other words, this is real, although, you know what, it really doesn't get tougher. Once you discover the pattern, then it's always that way. Um, but... The fact is, is that when you're using Kramer's rule on a 2 by 2 matrix, which is what this becomes, it's not a 3 by 3. For it to be a 3 by 3, you still have Kramer's rule could be used on a 3 by 3, but you'd need an extra variable. You'd need a Z somewhere and a third equation. And then we'd be looking at X equals the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix divi divided by the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. Understand? Justin, you still there? Oh, I'm here. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I guess... The bottom line, let's just prepare you for two-by-twos. I can't imagine that on your final they're going to give you a three-by-three three and expect you to solve it using Kramer's rule. But they almost certainly are going to give you two equations and two unknowns. Yeah. Now, you could solve those the old-fashioned way and come up with an X and a Y, just to verify that you're doing it properly. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <coughs> In other words, it's easy to mix this up. I know the X term goes right to left, and the Y term goes left to right. Uh-huh. So it's really easy to make a mistake there. But the one sure way that you can know whether you get the right answer or not is to go back to the old elimination method or substitution method. So you know what X and Y are, right? In other words, I don't have to use Kramer's rule to solve it. Uh -huh. I can come up with what the X and the Y value are using good old-fashioned algebra 1. However, they undoubtedly are going to make you show your work. In other yeah. words, they're not going to let you solve this the old-fashioned way. They're going to force you to solve it using Kramer's rule, and that uh -huh. requires you to do that part and this part. Gotcha. In other words, the determinant of the numerator divided by the determinant of that denominator. And the key is to get it in the right order. Not an easy problem. It's not an easy thing to remember. Um, no, it really isn't. This is probably the hardest thing we've covered 
in terms yeah. of memorizing how to do it. Yeah. Um, so now number 37 I would really like help with. Okay. This is actually fairly straightforward. Okay. Yeah. That distance is halfway between the distance of the top base and the bottom base. Yeah. So give me an equation I can write. Uh, 3x plus 1. Or well, okay. No, I'll, I'll start there. You don't have to start in the middle. 3x plus 1 plus 6x minus 5 all over 2 equals 4x plus 4. You got it. It's that simple. Now you have one equation and one variable, x. You don't have any problem solving that, right? Well, so then um, 8x plus 8 equals... Hold on, hold on, hold on. What do you get in the numerator? First of all, I, let me do something that I'm always recommending. Get rid of your denominators. How do I get rid of that 2? That 2 is a denominator. Yeah. How do you get rid of it? So I can multiply everything by 2. So okay. Then and that leaves me a very simple numerator on the left side. Yeah. And on the right side, it gives me 8x plus 8. Yeah, exactly. Now, this is much easier to solve, right? Yeah. Always get rid of your denominators if you can. Denominators and parentheses. Well, I didn't need these parentheses. They didn't, weren't doing anything. So I could erase those without changing anything. Now what I have is 9x minus 4 equals 8x plus 8. I'm going to move the 8x to the left. I'm going to move the 4 to the right. Here's your answer. Oh, wow. That's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Once you get rid of denominators, equations become so much easier to solve. Yeah. But that's not the difficulty of this problem. The difficulty of this problem is knowing that the median is the average between the two bases. Always. Okay. It's always equal to the average between the top and the bottom. When you're talking about a trapezoid, a trapezoid is defined by two bases being parallel to one another and different lengths. Okay. That's what we're looking at there. And the median is always the average base. And you get averages by adding that to that and dividing by two. Yeah. All right. What, what problem next would you like to look at? Uh, 39 right here okay. on the bottom. This is relatively easy because they've given you two angles, which means they've really given you three angles. Yeah. Right. So let's draw a triangle. In other words, Usually, you only get three pieces of information when they ask you to solve a triangle. Well, they've given us four pieces of information. Ah. A is 48. B is 43. Therefore, C is what? 89. Now, what does that say B is equal to? It's crossed out on mine. Oh, I said 69. 69? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Is that an accurate picture of our problem? Yes, sir. Solve it using the law of signs. In other words, the reason, the reason I know we can use the law of signs 
is because I have an angle and an opposite side relationship. Yeah, exactly. Once you have that, you're using the law of signs always. Okay. Did I set it up correctly on the bottom there? Well, yeah, no, it's the law of signs. It's not the law of cosines or tangents. So here's what the bottom should read. The sine of A over A equals the sine of B over B equals the sine of C over C. It's the law of signs. Gotcha. Okay. Now let's fill in. So, get me started. What's our only relationship that we have? Uh, sine of 43 degrees over 69. That's a fixed constant in this problem. In other words, every angle we're looking at and opposite side has to fit that relationship. So, gotcha. what's that equal to? And you can solve for either variable. There's only two variables left, C and A, the side lengths. So what should I write next? Uh, let's see. You should write sine of A over 48 degrees. What is the sine? What is A? Uh, what is angle A? Angle A is 48 degrees. So it's the sine of 48 over little side A, which we don't know yeah. yet. We're trying to solve for. Notice uh -huh. there's only one variable there, A. Everything else is a number. Okay. So you can definitely solve for little a. And when I go to solve for little c, I can use that same initial relationship because it's the same as sine of 89 over little c. Again, only one variable there, c. So you yeah. can solve for a and c, and now you've solved the triangle. You've got all three sides, all three angles. Yeah. And that's just getting numbers out of your calculator. Okay. In other words, I'm presuming you know how to do that algebra. But uh -huh. you're going to have to get those numbers out of your calculator. But this is not correct. Uh, it's yeah, all I it. signs. In other words, that's almost correct. The only thing wrong with it is that should be sine. And that should be sine. Okay. Okay. In other words, in any triangle, the sine of the angle divided by its opposite side length is a constant. It's the same no matter which angle you're talking about. It can be angle A or angle B or angle C. Okay. Well, we don't have a lot of time. I do have an 8 o'clock. Um, is there another one you want to look at? Uh, Let's see. Not on that last thing you sent me. Mm, let me open this one that has six attachments on it. No? Okay. That's not that one either. It's this one here. Is there anything on any of these six attachments that you want to go over in three minutes? Um, can, you, can you click the uh, middle right? Middle right? Yeah. That's what we were just looking at. Oh. Uh, how about bottom right? Bottom right? Okay, we haven't done this one. Oh, then run up the answer key. Oh, that is the answer key, isn't it? No? Yeah, it must be. I don't see any questions, is all I see is answers.
like this one here. Yeah, remember angle C was 89 degrees? Yeah. Side C must have ended up being 101.158 and side A yeah. was 75. But, yeah. yeah, so this is the answer key to that last page, only we didn't see the page for some of these other questions, but we don't really have time to do it tonight anyway. So let's call that a session, and you've got one more session tomorrow night, right, Justin? I think I do. Okay. Try to figure out what problems you want to go over before we start, so that we're not gotcha. so that we're not looking through six different documents. All right. All right. Have a good one. I'll talk to you tomorrow night. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right.